Welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And this week's topic and title is Agreement on the Debt Limit at a Huge Price. And with me today to discuss this issue is my co-host, Jay Fidel, and our special esteemed guest, Chuck Crumpton. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Tim. Tim, Jay. You know, uh, we're getting very close to the House of Representatives passing the deal struck between Kevin McCarthy and President Joe Biden. Uh, there's a lot of people who are very upset. The MAGA GOP are flaming red hot mad. And on the Democratic progressive side, we have a lot of environmentalists who are none too pleased. But uh, to discuss that, but before we discuss that, hey, Chuck, I want to go to you. I want to talk about how the media has portrayed this entire uh, negotiation and, and how they're portraying the negotiation right at this moment. Well, that's a really good question because the media presents its own perspective on things, as we know, and they can do it either with a comprehensive truth and accuracy orientation, or they can do it with a whatever is going to inflame and attract the most readers, viewers, audience. <clears throat> the media for at least the last few years, the Trump years and continuing, <clears throat> have chosen route two, which is viewership over truth and accuracy <clears throat> at, at any expense. So what we're seeing right now is media portraying the debt ceiling negotiations as a win-lose competition. Who won? If they were going to choose an approach that was designed to maximize the risk to approval of such an agreement and the public interest harm from the risk of disapproval or disapproval itself, this is the way to do it. And nobody's portraying it as, you know, this was a compromise. Everybody got something except Joe Biden. Um, Let me ask you, uh, you know, this one appears it's going to pass. Um, I think uh, Hakeem Jeffries from the House has expressed that he's he's encouraging all Democrats to vote for this in the House of Representatives. And then, of course, you'll have the non-mega GOP most likely support it as Kevin McCarthy is requesting. So I'm not saying it's a slam dunk, but it looks like this thing's gonna pass. What if this thing was a lot closer and the media was playing this off as the way they are, uh, a win-lose negotiation? And um, could that have disrupted the apple cart, so to speak? Well, you gotta think about one other thing though, Tim, which is uh, for McCarthy who took 15 votes to get his speakership and allegedly agreed to some conditions that put him at an especially high risk of losing that speakership and that authority. He can't afford to have a situation where the majority of Republicans vote against a deal that he made. He needs at least a majority of Republicans in that House to back him up. He's not going to get 100% by any means, he may get enough Democratic votes to put the vote over the top. That's the negotiation. That's the bipartisan aspect of this that really deserves far more media attention and investigation than it's received. Let's see how that works out. Who really winds up with what coalitions in the House and in the Senate to get this thing passed? Okay. What hey, Jay, uh, to, what, will have. to what degree do you think Joe Biden's um, favorability and or credibility has been damaged by the way this deal has been negotiated from the very start? Yeah, there was a piece in the paper, which uh, we put on our daily email advisory about that. And there's no question that it does have an effect on his mm, credibility and popularity in some circles anyway. Um, he started out with a red line, and then he crossed his own red line. He said, I won't negotiate, and then promptly negotiated. 
Uh, I don't know if people forgot that, but uh, I mean, what I mean is that a lot of people walking around thinking, what happened? There was a red line and now there's no red line. And he has not explained why he ignored his own red line. He has been silent on explaining that and, and very troublesome, I think. It's troublesome to me, and I think it's troublesome to a lot of yeah. other people. And I think in terms of his credibility for 2024, he's he's lost credibility. But whatever the result is, he has not been strong. Um, if he had never said anything about the red line, he would have been better off. But um, this whole scenario does not work in his favor. And, and you think of other things that have happened during his administration, and you say, hmm, um, this guy, this guy doesn't stick with it. This guy is not strong. That's what you mm -hmm. think. You know, is it just an issue of him not being able to separate the debt ceiling uh, increase from normal budget, you know, debates and negotiations about uh, the budget itself for the next 10 years? I mean, did he fail in that effort? Was that, is that his problem? Well, you know, to me, this is all out of Kafka. Chuck, I, I really need to know if you agree with that. Um, it's all a very strange alternative universe. Um, we have a debt ceiling. We've already incurred the debt. Trump himself incurred four point something trillion dollars in the last few years, not the whole administration, the last couple of years of his administration, four trillion dollars. A lot of the money that uh, the Republicans are hammering on is money that was um, adopted and enacted. Uh, during the Trump administration. Um, so, I, you know, I just, uh, I get a complete disconnect on this. There should be no issue about the debt ceiling. Just go ahead, lift the debt ceiling, and then then you negotiate the budget separately. And, and I think that um, it would have been just fine for uh, Joe Biden to stick on that point, because that's historically what usually has happened. And we are in this alternate universe. Another part of the alternate universe is that the Republicans themselves don't represent the um, negotiated results by uh, by uh, Kevin McCarthy? That's extraordinary. They go out, you know, and they have these negotiations. They they spend weeks negotiating, and then the Republicans, a number of them in the Freedom Caucus, don't don't agree. Um, and so what you have is uh, is chaos. They're creating chaos again, more um, even among themselves, and th this is very threatening to the country that we can't seem to respect the old red line of keep the debt ceiling different from the budget. Correct. Well, let me just run past uh, the positives and the and what the Democrats will perceive as negatives of this deal struck. Uh, <clears throat> number one is, you know, Joe Biden did avoid, did avoid a debt default that would have thrown this economy and the world economy in real chaos. Uh, number two is that uh, he was able to extend it for two years. So that's off the table for at least two years. Uh, Biden did protect Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare benefits. Uh, I'm sure there's some other benefits that were preserved, but those are the, the top that uh, come to mind. On the um, things that progressive Democrats are very upset about is um, there are now work requirements associated with uh, SNAP benefits. SNAP is, you, is the term for old food stamps. Uh, supplemental nutrition, and I don't remember the uh, the last two letters of that. But uh, that now kicks in for anyone who's uh, 55 or younger for work benefits for food stamps, SNAP benefits. Uh, there's expedited permits for energy products, uh, especially a natural gas pipeline from uh, Virginia all the way through the state. And that makes uh, the environmentalists of the Democratic wing fuming mad. There's steam rolling out of the ears. Uh, there is a non-military um, spending limited to 1%. So there's a cap on for, the, for quite a while for the 1% uh, increase of budget spending. They're going to shift $10 billion out of Biden's uh, IRS uh, funding that was passed. I think that was $80 billion. Now $10, $10 billion gets stripped out of that. And I think that's over a 10-year period. And then there's the return of fifty to $7 billion unspent in COVID funds, they go back to the uh, budget for uh, new dis redistribution. And last but not least, there is the reinstatement of payments that students will now need to start 
paying on uh, as a result. Remember, at COVID, there was a suspension of school debt. Now that, that suspension has been removed off the table. So let me get your reaction, Jay and Chuck, to what I just stated, uh, both on the uh, positive side and potentially on the negative side. Jay. Hmm. Well, I think a lot of that is ideological, and it's not its not public policy. It's something else. It's uh, the Republican non-platform operating. Um, and what, what strikes me is a lot of the people who are going to suffer because of those cuts are Republicans or, you know, Trump's base. And so, you know, I find it extraordinary that it's, it's sort of throw it on the wall and, and see if it sticks kind of negotiation. Um, when you have this, you don't have good, thoughtful public policy um, where reasonable men and women will get into a room and, um, you know, really um, negotiate. So this is, this is just an expression of one side beating up on the other. And, and it is a win-lose mentality on various issues. I mean, it, you know, for example, knocking off uh, some of the um, additional funding for the IRS will, will have a leverage effect. Um, they won't be able to collect as much money. I mean, what, what's, what's that about? Um, and of course, you know, we should talk about the, the tax side of this. Um, there's there's uh, no additional taxes, as I understand it. Um, and, uh, you know, what we, we, we have is a libertarian view of making government smaller. That's what happened here. And I think we have an example of divisiveness on a lot of these issues. Climate change, hmm, any hmm, broad-based journalist will tell you is the most important story, the most existential threat to our planet and our, you know, global society. And yet we don't care about it. Um, so a lot of this is, uh, is ideological. A lot of it is the old Republican platform. And I think they made inroads uh, in, in Biden's initiatives. Um, it was, they wanted to show that they had the clout. They wanted to show that they could really have an effect on things. And, and they have. Okay. Chuck, what was your impression of either... <clears throat> Biden's accomplishments or the things that he had to trade away in order to get this deal with um, House Speaker McCarthy? Well, three things. First of all, <clears throat> if you look at Joe Biden as you want him to be or you believe he should be, then Jay's assessment holds water. If you look at him who he really is and has always been for his decades in Washington, which is a center-right Democrat politician who is deeply committed to bipartisan deals to implement government policy. He's been exactly who he has always been, and that's worked for him. If you look at the media, as of today, most of them, even the conservative media, are saying Biden won the negotiation, the Democrats won the negotiation. They prevented the Republicans from getting what they really wanted, what the MAGA GOP wanted, and they held on to the things. Let, let, let me jump in right there. What, in your opinion, does the MAGA GOP want? <laughs> well, first of all, they claimed they wanted actual spending reduction. They didn't get that. They got limited spending increases but they did not get a reduction. They got some reductions in some general areas, but if you look at those six categories you laid out, every one of those can be administratively managed and adjusted. The Office of Budget Management and Budget is run by the administration. Yeah, Congress sets out guidelines and parameters and limitations, but unless somebody actually takes it all the way through court up to the U.S. Supreme Court, what the administrative executive branch people do is going to dictate what the operational level actions on behalf of the government are in all those areas. So it, if you look at what the Republicans, especially the mega, mega GOP, said they wanted most, budget reductions, <laughs> work requirements, cuts to areas that would include everything except Social Security and veterans' benefits. They didn't get that. Mm -hmm. Well, and let me just float a balloon here because I, I, I would argue that the mega GOP 
doesn't want the deal because quite frankly, I think they're looking for chaos, chaos within government, chaos in our financial economic markets, uh, chaos for an opportunity for their agenda, their true agenda, which they don't like to um, overtly discuss, but it's all about bringing in fascism and a fascist dictator by the name of Donald Trump. I think that's really why they're upset because uh, this thing's gonna go through. And well, maybe I'm wrong, well, but I uh, they, they there. many times on this. Can I stop you there, Tim? It, it, yes, um, there's a fair chance it will go through. There's also a fair chance it won't go through. Uh, if it doesn't go through, we still have the same problem we talked about last week. Um, and I and I and I really worry that a there will be pushback by the you know most conservative Republicans um, that that may actually stall it, and uh, which is really amazing given the fact that. The president of the United States and the Speaker of the House spent weeks negotiating this. Okay. Uh, the other the other aspect is that don't forget, guys, um, that this is um, kind of precedent. It will happen again. It will happen in two years. We'll be back to square one, first base again, uh, trying to get the debt ceiling raised or whatever it is, and we'll be held hostage again. Okay, well, Joe Biden has a year and a half left in office for his first term. Is this the time for him to explore the provisions of the 14th Amendment to make sure that doesn't happen? Oh, I assume he's been exploring that for the last few weeks. If Larry Tribe has been exploring it, then presumably he, he's aware of the issue and he should be exploring it. Uh, it's not going to mean anything uh, if this agreement is, is ratified. Um, if it is not ratified, uh, it'll mean a lot. And maybe he'll well, should, the have point to is, should it. they be preparing for the next round of um, potential uh, anarchy in our government system by the MAGA GOP? I would. I would. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Chuck, is, uh, is House Speaker McCarthy going to hear or feel any of the ramifications of his support for this deal? Uh, by the mega GOP, are they going to try to vote him or remove him as Speaker of the House? It only takes one vote or one person to bring it up. Yeah, if you look at what's happened within the last week, and we know that polls are consistently unreliable, but the polls were indicating that a substantial majority of Americans polled faulted the Republicans for putting the default risk out there. Hey, McCarthy has to be aware of that. He's got a completely split party. And he had to make a choice in these negotiations which element of that party he was going to have to hold on to to try to maintain his power and his image. He's an ambitious guy. So I don't, I don't think he gave up anything that he didn't very carefully intend to do. His alliance with the MAGA GOP is artificial, temporary, and if he could get rid of it, I'm sure he would. You know, um... We talked a little bit about those couple of provisions that were kind of given up in order to get this negotiation um, straightforward. Uh, one of them, of course, was um, work requirements for uh, SNAP benefits. Uh, I recall back in the Ginrich days that there was something called welfare to work, and that was quite uh, the Herculean effort to get those who are receiving welfare payments to actually go to work. Um, so there's that one provision, and then there's the, the requirement now for students to start paying on their debt. For those individuals in this country that are on the economic fringe, um, does this push them over the edge or even closer to the edge? Chuck. Well, first of all, both of those are subject to administrative executive decisions as to what and when and how they choose to enforce any of that stuff. The likelihood that the Biden administration is going to aggressively enforce the collection of student debt 
whether it's on the books and accruing or not, is no more likely now than it was two weeks ago or two months ago. I, I have not seen a policy change on behalf of Biden or the Democrats on that. The problem for the Republicans is because they didn't get anything that gives them more power or more leverage in debt ceiling negotiations. Yeah, it's only a year and a half, January 1st of 2025. Whoever that new president may be, they're going to face this thing again. And Jay is exactly right. It's going to be another war. But mm -hmm. who will run that war? Who will dominate that war at that point in time is going to depend on the 2024 elections. And I'm guessing that McCarthy has bet that the 2024 elections are going to go better for him than they will for Trump and the MAGA GOP. He has yeah. to bet that because if MAGA GOP prevails over him and whoever his faction might be, he's out. He doesn't really have any choice as to who he casts his lot with. It cannot be the MAGA GOP. But you know, let me let me add that uh, this this not only has an effect on Biden's prospects in 2024, it involves the rest of the horse race. Um, and so you get um, you get Trump um, opposing the deal, saying you guys should have stuck with the right wing approach on this, and you get DeSantis, uh, one of my favorite people ever. Um, uh, you know, he 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 is taking the same position. Nikki Haley is taking this position, and Scott is taking this. You know, all of the Republican candidates, all of them that we know about, maybe there's an exception out there somewhere, um, are saying this deal's not good enough for the Republicans. And, you know, uh, I don't know if you asked this implicitly or expressly, Tim, but, um, you know, the country has to have a reaction to the list of horribles uh, that got thrown away uh, in this negotiation. Mm -hmm. And as I said before, some of the people who are affected are Republicans, um, and they're you know they may be disadvantaged, but uh, they're also Republicans, um, so they're not going to be really happy when they realize how they're affected. But there are other people, you know, maybe independents and certainly Democrats, who are going to say this is this is really awful. And if these guys, that is the guys in the Republican horse race, are are saying it's not good enough. And um, we we like the original hard nosed approach, so um, they're they're all they're also going to come to the conclusion that the Republican Party, that is the people, both sides, come to the conclusion the Republican Party is is, is unhinged. Um, they're not even respecting an agreement that they participated in making. Uh, so I I think that at the end of the day, um, this has got to be um, affirmed, confirmed. Um, by the Republicans, including the Freedom Caucus, or else they will have such a stink eye, you know, um, you know, black eye in the in the in the in the view of the of the public in general that they will suffer greatly in the 2024 election. You know, it seems to me when Janet Yellen multiple times was talking about the ill effects of not extending the the debt ceiling, uh, she used generic broad-based terms like recession, interest rate increase, um, you know, financial markets in chaos. But they really didn't dig down deep enough, I don't think, that describe exactly what does that mean? Uh, what does it mean when the United States, for the first time, defaults on its ability to pay its, its, its creditors? And, and the, the, the damage that you, it's very difficult to describe and play that out, but I don't think they did a very good job of it. So. Um, the benefits of extending this ceiling, I think Joe Biden gets a, you know, a, a, a round of applause. Uh, and the things that were given up, it could have been far, far worse. Uh, am, I, am I wrong in that assessment, either of you? No, that's oh, I, I would agree with you, but I would add one point that came up in your comment a minute ago, um, and, and that is this. Um, although Joe Biden did not speak loudly enough about the red line problem, he had Janet Yellen and a number of other members of administration um, giving us uh, what would happen if this deal failed. That is, if, if the um, if debt ceiling were not raised. And, and they saturated the airwaves with that for weeks. You and think Americans they... understood it? Not necessarily. 
And, and, and I'm not saying that they were correct either. This is speculative. Um, but the fact is they made it sound so horrible, so nightmarish, you know, that, that it, in, in effect, they, they pasted that risk on the Republicans. And I think that also works in the crucible of, of 2024, that we would have been in Armageddon. Uh, and, and, and Janet Yellen did, did convey that message. And so um, I think that's a factor here. Mm -hmm. uh, Chuck, you had a comment on that? Yeah, I think that's an important insight that both you and Jay have shared. And that is that if the Republicans and certainly McCarthy have learned anything, it's that you got to be careful where you place your chips. If you place your chips on election denial, which most Republicans did, Senate and House, in at the time of the insurrection, that hasn't worked out well for them. If they place their chips on, we're going to push this to the edge of default on the national debt, nationally, domestically, and internationally, that didn't work well for them. I think Jay's exactly right. I, I think if you ask the question, who blinked, everybody blinked. Mm. But to come out after and say we didn't, just costs them even more credibility. So I think Jay is exactly right. When it comes around to 2024, you know, if you look at the economic measures that have been put in place, if you look at the debt ceiling and budget deal that is being worked out, and as Jay indicates, probably will be passed. That's more favorable to Biden than it is to the Republicans because they're factionalized. I want to add one other point to your point earlier, Chuck. You know, you said this is Biden's career uh, in Congress and especially in the Senate. He's been um, bipartisan, seeking solutions, uh, avoiding rancor, all that. And I think, you know, the bottom line of everything we've talked about here today favors him. Why? It's because he said uh, after he failed on the bottom of the red line, um, he, because he did negotiate a deal, he did raise the debt limit, he did avoid Armageddon. And for that, he looks like the peacemaker. He looks good. He looks like the one that solves problems. So when you shake it and bake it, every consideration we've mentioned here today I think he won this game. Doesn't matter what the exact terms and you know the giveaways are on one side or the other. He looks like the reasonable statesman. That's the way it came off. Good point. And I agree. Hey, uh, we're almost out of time. So last question. You know, we have probably in the next week or so, we have uh, former Vice President Mike Pence and uh, former Governor of uh, New Jersey Chris Christie. They're going to enter into the GOP presidential ring for 2024. Does the discussion or the debate change significantly for new uh, rounds of negotiation, no matter what it is? Does, does that sound different with these two candidates in the, in the ring? Some people say that the more candidates you have on the Republican side of that debate, I say debate because that's where Trump can shine, as he did before. Um, the more candidates you have, on the stage with him, the better it is for him because he knows how to distinguish himself, okay? And, and that would be the presumptive answer to your question. However, you know, in, in past debates, in past contentions among a field of Republican candidates, um, they were either intimidated or unprepared for his style on the stage. That is no longer the case. You, I mean, I, I, Pence to me is a non a non event, but Christie, he has attacked Trump before, and he may lead a charge against him. So if Trump thinks he's going to have the same kind of experience with all the the games he played with Hillary Clinton, with all the games he played with the other Republican candidates, I think he's wrong. I think well, Christie may is likely to openly attack Trump in that debate. Um, and encourage other Republican candidates to do the same. 
So I don't think we can assume that what happened before will happen again. I think it'll be different. Okay. Chuck, same question. Yeah, I think Jay's exactly right. That if you look at it superficially, the script looks the same. It looks like an ideal setting for Trump. The more people in the mix, the better for him because he stands out in his own way, no matter how offensive it might be. But he, Jay is right. If you've got people like Christie who are willing to attack him much more aggressively than anyone ever has, and you've got people like Tim Scott on the other side who said, you know, there are people who can actually coexist with other people and deal rationally and civilly with other people. I happen to be one of those people. I offer that alternative. <laughs> are you, you, are you running for president, Chuck? We need to know. Uh, Tim Scott. Oh, sorry. Oh, I took it the same way you did, Jay. <laughs> I, I would nominate if I had the power to do so. All right, guess what? We've run out of time. So quickly, uh, your last thoughts in the last month and a half on this whole mess, and it hasn't passed, but I think it's going to pass. And I think they'll get both enough Democrat and Republican, not not GOP, or excuse me, mega GOP Republicans, but just good old fashioned Republicans that will vote this through in the House. Jay, your last thoughts. I blame the Republicans for chaos. Um, this whole thing, you know, having a, having a stroke by stroke public disclosure public discussion of everything that goes back and forth. It's all theater. And uh, it's not good for the country. Uh, they should have done what they did in years past, just raise the debt ceiling and get into hearings about the budget. Um, they didn't do that. This is all, mm, this is all theater. And uh, it demonstrates that our Congress is broken. Uh, and I, I, all I can say is that I am not encouraged in general. I'm encouraged by the fact that we won't have Armageddon, but in general, I'm not encouraged with the efficiency, uh, the um, you know the functionality of our Congress. And meanwhile, they have not addressed so many problems facing this country. They have abandoned public policy. It's all theater. All right, Chuck, you get the last word on this. Well, I think the key contrast over here. You look over at the Democratic side of the fence, and although there is a resistance verbally from some of the progressive Democrats. Overall, the Democrats and Biden have maintained a far more unified, consistent front. The Republicans are split against each other. That offers a clear contrast. So which voting coalitions come together to pass this debt ceiling budget combo deal in the House and in the Senate may tell us a lot more about the coalitions that are going to offer the most promise for the future. And that may have an impact on the 2024 elections. Who can connect with those coalitions the best? So in a sense, this whole thing has been beneficial if those coalitions do combine forces and get things done for, our, for the American people. And with that, I'd like to thank my uh, co-host, Jay Fidel, and our esteemed guest, Chuck Crumpton, for joining us today on American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And won't you join us next week? And until then, aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.